Well, good evening and thank you everyone for joining us at the end of your working day on a Monday. My name is David Thomas. I'm a managing associate in the dispute resolution team here at Linklaters and a member of our cross-practice ESG group. And I'm very pleased to be joined this evening by my colleague, Rebecca James, who is also a managing associate in the dispute resolution team and a fellow member of the ESG group. And we are very fortunate also to be joined by Saad Hussain QC of 106 Court. We are here this evening to talk about climate litigation risk. And that is, in our view, one of the most interesting areas of law at the moment, and certainly an area where the litigation risks in many jurisdictions are still developing and seem only likely to increase. And I suspect you've all chosen to join us at this time on Monday because you share that view. Um, however, if anyone did need persuading, we have the statistics to back it up. According to the LSE's Climate Rules Database, over 1,700 climate litigation cases have been brought worldwide to date, and over half of those cases have been brought in the last five years. So the trend is sharply upwards, and the factors contributing to that trend show no sign of abating. National and international commitments on climate risk continue to be strengthened. The science of climate attribution is continuing to develop. New legal duties are being established and existing legal duties are being tested and expanded in many jurisdictions. And what we might describe as the soft law burden on business is also increasing as expectations of what constitutes corporate best practice embrace not just climate risk, but ESG risks more broadly. So this evening, we'll be looking at a few areas of risk from a UK perspective. Um, but before we dive into that, we thought it would be helpful to provide an overview of some of the global trends in climate litigation risk. And for that, I will hand over to Rebecca. Thanks, David. I agree with all of that. There has certainly been a sharp rise in climate change related civil litigation in recent years and an even sharper rise in the last couple of years. And this trend seems uh, set to continue. It is also important to note that climate change related litigation is often pursued by activist investors or other interested parties for strategic reasons, which increases the chance of claims being pursued. So it's worth spending a bit of time at the outset, just looking at the global picture and unpacking the types of claims that we've been seeing before zooming back in to look at the UK in more detail. The first area worth touching on is claims brought against governments to change policy and conduct in relation to climate change. And what is interesting here is not just that these claims are being brought, but actually that some of them are now succeeding. For example, 18 months ago, in the landmark Uganda case, the Dutch Supreme Court found that the Dutch government has obligations to urgently and significantly reduce emissions in line with human rights obligations. Early last month, the Administrative Court of Paris found the French government responsible for failing to take sufficient action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And just late last month, the German Federal Constitutional Court ruled that provisions of the German Climate Change Act are incompatible with fundamental rights insofar as they lack sufficient requirements for further emission reductions from 2031 onwards. And although these claims are not pursued against private parties directly, they can obviously result in fundamental changes to overarching legal and regulatory frameworks with indirect knock-on impact for business. Another key public law trend that we've been seeing is challenges to government decision-making in relation to projects with a heavy carbon footprint under public or planning law. Now, of course, projects are only as viable as their approvals, permits, and licenses are solid. And even if unsuccessful, these sorts of challenge can generate considerable adverse scrutiny and take time to resolve. So on any view, they can have a significant impact for project developers and financiers. Turning next to the sorts of claims that are being brought directly against private entities. Uh, first, there have been some claims uh, brought against high emitters seeking to force change to their emission, emissions reduction targets and actions. So for example, in the Netherlands, a claim has been pursued seeking an order requiring Shell to reduce the CO2 emissions associated with its activities and fossil fuel products, and we're expecting to see a judgment later this month. And meanwhile, else, elsewhere in Europe, Client Earth pursued a claim against the operators of a major Polish power plant seeking to block them from burning lignite or requiring measures to reduce CO2 emissions by 2035. 
There are also some other important and relevant issues in civil litigation against private parties, which will really be at the very heart of our discussion today. One of those is claims against carbon majors in connection with their alleged responsibility for climate change impacts. And these sorts of claims do not only pose a risk for the companies facing them, but also indirectly for those involved in investing in them. And another is claims brought by investors against private entities regarding the adequacy of climate change related decision making and disclosures in the context of increasing regulation and investor activism. Finally, we have seen a rise in complaints through soft law mechanisms, particularly complaints to OECD national contact points in connection with adverse human rights and environmental impact. And whilst the OECD guidelines are not legally binding, these complaints can nonetheless pose significant reputational and legal risk to businesses. Thanks, Rebecca. And perhaps you could say a few words about how that global trend is being reflected in the UK. Sure. So in contrast to certain other countries, perhaps most notably uh, the US and Australia, we really have not seen very much climate change litigation in the UK to date. However, the UK government has been facing an increasing number of environmentally focused judicial review proceedings, scrutinizing the lawfulness of public decision-making in light of the UK's climate targets. Many, if not all of those joining us will recall the challenge to the third runway at Heathrow Airport, uh, the government's approval of the runway was found to be invalid because ministers had failed to take account uh, of the UK's commitments under the Paris Agreement. However, late last year, the Supreme Court overturned the decision. And more recently, there was a high profile challenge to the Drax power station in North Yorkshire, which was ultimately unsuccessful. We've also seen some complaints to the FRC in respect of climate change reporting um, by some major UK entities. And there has been a high profile complaint against the carbon major to the UK OECD national contact points in relation to alleged greenwashing uh, of, of energy transition through an advertising campaign, uh, a complaint which was ultimately withdrawn after the, the ad campaign was, was stopped. So what else are we seeing? Look, in terms of private law litigation, not much else at the moment, to be honest, but based on the global trends that I've just dipped into, it is certainly possible that, that claims of this nature will arise in the future. And that is what we're going to focus on in more detail tonight. Brilliant. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so to analyze what the private law climate litigation risks are for business, it's perhaps helpful first to try and categorize the risks. As will be apparent from Rebecca's summary of the various different types of claim that are being pursued, that's not straightforward. And I've yet to see a framework that works perfectly. However, a number of years ago, the Bank of England proposed three broad categories of climate liability risk for business. The first category is the failure to mitigate. And in this category are claims relating to a company's alleged contribution to the physical impact of climate change. And these claims are most likely to be formulated as tortious claims in nuisance or negligence. The second category is the failure to adapt. And in this category are claims relating to a company's alleged failure to take account of climate risks in their acts, emissions or decision making. And it's often suggested that these claims are most likely to be formulated as breach of director's duties claims. And the third category is the failure to disclose or comply. And in this category are claims relating to a company's alleged failure properly or accurately to disclose matters relating to climate risk. And these claims are likely to rely on statutory reporting obligations, but could also be brought in the context of a company's voluntary disclosures. So this evening, we're going to try and dig a little deeper into each of those three categories of private law climate litigation claim. And starting first with the private law claims relating to a company's alleged contribution to climate change. This has been a feature of US climate litigation for some time. And Saad, perhaps you could start by giving us a brief overview of the US private law cases of this kind against energy majors. Uh, thanks, David. Yes, of course. So we're currently seeing a wave of uh, private actions in the United States by states and municipalities against the large energy producers, the carbon majors, uh, which are tort claims mainly in nuisance, alleging that those carbon majors are responsible for a part of the CO2 emissions that have caused municipalities to incur very substantial climate mitigation costs. Uh, and it says that they're at fault because they have produced and sold these hydrocarbons. Uh, 
knowing that burning them will cause significant climate change. Uh, this is a second wave, uh, mainly since 2017. Uh, it is a renewed attempt to hold carbon majors liable after a failed first wave uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, that first wave was uh, failed claims also by states and municipalities um, for alleged climate change impacts. Um, they failed because they were uh, brought under federal law, uh, but ultimately it was held that under federal law it was the Environmental Protection Agency that had exclusive responsibility. And it was a political question. Uh, but interestingly for today's purposes, they also, uh, some of them at least, failed on grounds of causation. So, for example, in the Kivalina case, the claimants were Eskimo peoples from Alaska. They were claiming damages against ExxonMobil and others for damage caused by coastal erosion and the melting of Arctic sea ice and permafrost. Uh, the first instance court said there was no realistic possibility of tracing any particular alleged effect of global warming to any particular emissions by any specific person. Uh, and of course, that may seem like a statement of the obvious climate change is a global phenomenon. We're all contributors uh, to it. How can you identify a single person who's been responsible for it? Um, but we now have a second wave of US cases, which has attempted to address both uh, the standing problem and the causation problem. And as things stand presently, although it's still ongoing, it, it looks like this uh, second wave may well also uh, founder on jurisdictional grounds. Uh, but the claims uh, have certainly been formulated in a way that seems more promising for the claimants on causation grounds. So far as standing is concerned, um, uh, the time is too short to get into the details of it. But essentially what these new claims do is they seek to characterize the claims as claims under state law rather than federal law. And certainly some of those uh, have been rejected. That, that argument has been rejected quite uh, in a number of recent claims, but we'll see uh, what will happen in the future. Um, so far as the causation problems are concerned, um, interestingly, first of all, these cases predominantly focus on sea level rises rather than wider climate, climate changes, um, identifying those as a, as a kind of persistent and measurable change that can more readily be seen as dependent in a dose dependent way on CO2 emissions. Uh, and secondly, uh, there is an attempt to draw on recent climate attribution science in order to identify the effects that are said to have been contributed to global warming by specific companies, um, uh, as opposed to the companies on block. Uh, worth mentioning also is that there are some European counterparts to these private law claims, most notably the German claim uh, Leo v. RWE, uh, where a Peruvian homeowner supported by an NGO is claiming for the effects of glacier melting on the habitabil habitability of his home. Uh, said to be contributed to by RWE as to 0.47%. And that claim has passed the preliminary stage, so it seems that causation will be uh, tested there. Uh, now, given that there hasn't ever been a private claim in the UK of the kind seen in the US, we're obviously entering into the realms of speculation as to what it might be. But in principle, it, there might be claims by groups of individuals or businesses, perhaps backed by NGOs, uh, for damage caused by uh, single climate change influenced events, uh, or conceivably you could have claims by local authorities in low lying coastal areas uh, in the manner of the US claims to be compensated for the costs of programs uh, to mitigate the effects of actual and anticipated sea level rises. Thank you, Saad. Um, so you've mentioned that establishing causation has been a challenge in these cases, and I know this is the issue you would uh, like particularly to focus on today. So perhaps could you summarise the approach of the cause courts to causation in general, and then highlight for us some of the particular difficulties that would arise in any claims for man-made climate change? Yes, of, of course. So, uh, I mean, I should start by saying causation is obviously going to be only one of the difficulties faced by any such claim in the UK. Uh, amongst other things, you're going to have issues about duty, issues about responsibility of parent companies for subsidiary actions, breach issues, limitation issues, uh, not, uh, not to say how these cases would be funded, but for today's purposes, it's obviously a big topic. And uh, what we thought we would do is have a look in a little more detail about causation, where we're talking about showing causation in fact and causation in law. Uh, causation in fact is would, it, would the uh, damage have occurred but for the defendant's actions. Causation in law are the defendants culpably responsible for the harm. Uh, and I thought worth focusing on perhaps three key questions. Um, how can you establish man-made causation when the climate science is so complex and uncertain? Uh, 
How can you identify causation by a specific company amongst many? Uh, how can you uh, uh, distinguish between innocent and guilty emissions and between producers um, and emitters? And some of the way in which the cases have been put in the US shed some light on that. So in principle, you might have a single event caused by climate change, uh, or you might have damage caused gradually by years of warming temperatures. So you might put a tornado, extreme drought, flood, landslip into the former category, coastal erosion, sea level rises, and so on into the cumulative category. Uh, and the difference may be important because a person who's a significant cause of a single event is liable for the whole of the damage subject to contribution. Whereas if there's a cumulative event, then each of the tort feasors will be liable only for that contribution to it. And so it might seem attractive then for claimants to say, well, uh, we're, we're going to contend for damage as a single event and fix the carbon major with responsibility for all of that. The, the reality, I think, is that it looks extremely challenging. Uh, first, causation is about causing an increase in the risk of a harmful event occurring. Uh, sorry, causation is not about causing uh, an increase in the risk of a harmful event occurring. It is about causing the event itself. So how can you prove that a particular event, a tornado or some such, was caused by climate change rather than what might be called an ordinary tornado? The most you can ever say is that the climate change has increased the risk of tornadoes occurring, but that is not enough. Um, secondly, it might be said that the carbon majors as a block have contributed significantly enough to climate change to be regarded as a cause. But even leaving aside the need to establish individual responsibility, there are obviously many other contributing causes to climate change, not least deforestation, intensive farming, population increase, um, other, the byproducts of other chemical processes, and so on. So that all makes it a rather challenging exercise to say, even in respect of a, a single event, this would not have occurred but for the contribution of, let's say, the carbon majors. But in the uh, the, the German case, Leo, the RUE, interestingly, it does seem that there an increase in risk was regarded as being uh, sufficient to establish causation. Uh, and that was a case where the appeal court overturned the causation approach at first instance. Uh, but it seems unlikely that an English court would take a similar approach. Uh, indeed, the English courts really have only done so in one very limited scenario concerning uh, mesothelioma cases, uh, the untreatable lung cancer cases. And in those cases, just by way of background, the, the risk of contracting the disease increases with exposure to asbestos, but the biological cause of the disease is not dose dependent, but may be caused by a single filament of asbestos entering the lung uh, and causing the cancerous growth. Uh, and that gave no, no problems where you've got one period of employment, one period of asbestos exposure, but it creates a causation dilemma in the common case where you've got multiple periods of employment multiple periods of exposure, and it's never possible to show through which em employment the critical asbestos filament um, uh, entered the lung. But it would be absurd from a policy perspective to find neither employer liable in those circumstances, and the English court has in those cases developed an exception where it is sufficient to show that the defendant employer was a significant cause of an increased risk of contracting the disease. That I think raises the question whether the English court would be prepared to do so but when it comes to climate change actions, but it does seem unlikely. Um, the so-called Fairchild principle was limited to multiple mesothelioma cases. It was necessary to prevent a patent legal absurdity. Um, uh, it, it, the court would have to be similarly determined to fix carbon majors with liability to take a similar step here. Uh, and the reality is that that may well be a step that the courts would think more appropriate for statute than parliament. So much for single events, that leaves cumulative events. Um, and one now perhaps sees why the second wave of US cases has relied on increases in sea level changes in their claim. Such changes are gradual um, uh, and therefore, uh, and dependent largely on the amount of CO2 emissions over time. Uh, and so one can identify a case that says each defendant is liable for its contribution to that gradual change. Um, it, 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 but there are obviously all manner of causation difficulties that come uh, with that. It's impossible to trace a specific company's CO2 emissions in a causal chain to specific sea level rises. The interaction between CO2 emissions and sea level rises is highly complex 
and only really able to be understood through computer modeling based on scientific assumptions. Those models and forecasts, uh, of course, show a huge variation in their outputs um, and, and the relationship between temperature or sea level rises and CO2 is, of course, by no means linear. It might be said this is simply an impossible task, uh, and certainly it makes identifying a specific molecular chain of causation impossible. Uh, it makes a precise allocation of causal role impossible as well. Uh, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that these kinds of difficulty are insuperable. Um, we are, after all, dealing with a balance of probabilities test. Uh, the court does not always demand of science that it provides a complete answer where it cannot. And where tracing specific causation is difficult, there is a place for correlation, modeling and forecasts. That is the, effectively the approach that has been endorsed, endorsed in the German case. Uh, and it may well, uh, if it, uh, uh, on this uh, kind of case, be adopted here as well. Of course, assessing overall um, climate science is one thing. Attributing responsibility to individual hydrocarbon producers is quite another. And as I mentioned, the second wave of US cases has attempted to deal with this uh, by drawing on the developing field of climate attribution science. Uh, so that, no doubt, is something that would be also used here if claims were to manifest. Um, uh, until fairly recently, when people have been looking at responsibility for climate change, it's been done on a state-by-state -state basis with a view to uh, lobbying government to take more action. In recent years, however, that has moved to uh, an ability to construct from published records the emissions of CO2 and methane from uh, hydrocarbons produced by specific uh, carbon majors on a company by company basis, um, often expressly with the aim of assisting potential litigants. Uh, what's interesting about it is it produces very precise uh, results down to uh, decimal points for the contribution of individual companies. But as, as is often the case, the, the precision can be misleading because of the huge uncertainty inherent in the estimates underpinning the calculation. To give just a few examples, it's necessary to look at all historical production for specific companies uh, going back hundreds of years in order to determine their contribution. The uses to which that production have to be put uh, then have to be estimated. And of course, some will be released, some stored, and depending on the use, the carbon release will vary. Production has to be traced through many corporate changes and restructurings, and somehow double counting of production as production is sold between multiple parties has to be avoided, all of which being done in the context of incomplete records and data. None of this work has yet been tested through the courts. I'm not sure, actually, thinking about it, that there has ever been a more complex expert exercise uh, attempted uh, to say nothing of the disclosure requirements that would be required. So I'd just very quickly then, even if you get this far, um, there are other quite significant issues that are going to be faced uh, with, with causation. Uh, the first is that the base of the US claims is that it is the producer of the hydrocarbons that is responsible for their subsequent emissions. But the producer is not or may not be the emitter. Um, what about the power companies who generate electricity, the road users, the consumers with electricity, gas or oil in their homes? And the essential question is whether one or both a producer or an emitter are to be regarded in law as causally responsible. And if both, whether the producer should nonetheless be reliable for the whole damage on the basis that they are a significant cause. And one can certainly see the arguments that it is the emitter who voluntarily chooses to burn the hydrocarbons knowing of the risks who is responsible. And secondly, one is going to have to distinguish between guilty emissions, if I can put it that way, and innocent emissions. The climate change attribution work goes back centuries. For most of that period, um, production has been innocent in the sense that before any point when it could have been known that burning hydrocarbons would cause climate change. So there's going to be a huge debate, uh, and we don't know the answer yet, about where the line should be drawn. Should it be 1990 when the IPCC reached the conclusion that CO2 was the cause of man-made climate change, or should it be some earlier date? And we've seen in the American, some, certain American proceedings that um, uh, investor activist-led uh, um, litigation has been suggesting that one ought to go back to the 1970s. So to conclude, I think, on this very big topic, one thing is clear, the causation obstacles to any claim are formidable, but as we've seen in the US, that does not necessarily mean that they will not be made. Um, yes. 
David, uh, over to you. Thank you, Saad. Um, so the second and third categories of claim that we're going to discuss this evening are the failure to adapt claims founded in director's duties and the failure to disclose claims founded in director's duties and or statutory and voluntary reporting regimes. But before we dive into the causes of action that are most likely to be relevant to those types of claims, it's perhaps helpful um, to start with an overview of the statutory duties of directors and climate risk reporting obligations that are relevant to both. So turning first to directors duties, uh, in the UK, the Companies Act 2006 codified certain common law and equitable duties of directors. And in the context of climate litigation risk, the two most relevant duties under the Act are um, the duty to act in good faith to promote the success of the company under Section 172, and the duty to exercise reasonable care, skill and diligence under Section 174. The duty under 172 is expanded by six non-exhaustive factors that the Act requires directors to have regard to. These include the likely consequences of any decision in the long term, the impact of the company's operations on the community and the environment, and the desirability of the company maintaining a reputation for high standards of business conduct. So in many jurisdictions, it's no doubt acknowledged that the days are long gone where climate risk and environmental issues were perhaps a fringe concern that might impact directors' duties only in the context of specific projects. But in the UK, that is reflected in a statutory duty binding upon directors properly to consider climate risk matters. And of course, that provides a statutory hook for any alleged failure to do so. However, for anyone trying to establish a breach of duty and liability on the part of a director, the scope of that statutory duty under Section 172 is qualified in several important respects. First, the duty is owed by the director to the company, not to shareholders, and therefore it is only the company that can bring an action for breach of that duty. Second, the duty to have regard to environmental impacts is subordinate to the overarching duty to promote the success of the company. And that is a relatively amorphous duty in itself. Uh, two people acting in good faith might reasonably disagree on how to promote the success of the company based on their experiences, views on corporate strategy and risk appetite, to name just a few possible variables. And third, the obligation to have regard to the impact on the environment of any decision is only that. You can have regard to something and still decide that another factor is more important. And there's nothing in the Act to suggest that any one of these non-exhaustive considerations merits more weight than the other. As the GC100 guidance states, the Section 172 duty does not require directors to balance the interests of the company and those of other stakeholders, but to weigh up all the relevant factors and decide what best leads to the success of the company. So the express duty under Section 172 clearly has its limits, but the text of the statutory duty is not the end of the matter. Um, as Lord Sales stated in a speech in 2019, the Companies Act reflects the current bare bones statement of general directors' duties, and the changing environment in which they operate also has a significant impact upon what the law expects of directors in practice. And in the UK, as is the case uh, elsewhere, there is an ever increasing body of regulations and guidance concerning climate risk issues that might inform what is expected of a director under Section 172. Covering that in any detail would be a separate session in itself, but it's worth touching on a few key aspects of the framework that is developing around climate risks and that will inform directors' duties. First, uh, since 2019, there's been a statutory duty to include within a company's strategic report a statement which describes how directors have had regard to the non-exhaustive considerations listed at Section 172. And whilst that obligation is only to report what has been done, the introduction of this requirement will no doubt have caused directors to revisit how to demonstrate compliance with the 172 obligation. And of course, the statement provides another data point for those seeking to scrutinise how directors have had regard to climate risk matters. And in that regard, it's also worth noting that um, after the first year of this requirement having been in effect, the FRC made clear in its November 2020 letter to directors that it felt many companies had not sufficiently explained how the Section 172 duty had been complied with and encouraged companies to report more fulsomely on matters such as how feedback from stakeholders had been used in the decision-making process and the implications of decisions on long-term success. And in that same letter, the FRC also took the opportunity to remind directors uh, 
but a key finding of its recent climate review was that whilst annual reports might be meeting the Companies Act requirements for reporting on environmental matters, they were falling short of investor expectations. And cons consequently, amongst other recommendations, the FRC encouraged directors to ensure reports included a balanced description of how climate policies and targets had been incorporated into business plans and their expected business impact. Second, and more briefly, uh, the FRC's UK Corporate Governance Code and the Supporting Guidance emphasises directors' uh, responsibility to consider long-term value and the sustainability of the company's business model and encourages directors to have regard to sources of guidance such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures or TCFD, um, OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact. And third, the TCFD is moving rapidly to become a mandatory part of UK corporate reporting. You'll no doubt be aware that in November of last year, the Chancellor announced that the UK will become the first country in the world to make TCFD aligned disclosures fully mandatory across the economy by 2025. The FCA has announced that from January of this year, premium listed companies are expected to include a statement in their annual financial report stating where, uh, whether they have made disclosures consistent with the recommendations of the TCFD or explaining why they haven't. And the UK government has only just closed a consultation seeking views on proposals to require large publicly quoted companies, private companies and LLPs to disclose climate related financial information in line with the four overarching pillars of the TCFD by April 2022. Fourth, it's worth noting there is sufficient concern about potential greenwashing, that is companies overstating their credentials or green credentials to investors or consumers that both the FCA and the CMA are looking at this, and I think we can anticipate further regulation in that space. And finally, and on a related note, looking beyond the UK horizon, there is the EU Sustainable Finance Package comprising the new Sustainability Disclosure Regulation, Taxonomy and Carbon Benchmarks Regulation. And believe it or not, that really is only a snapshot of the growing body of regulation concerning climate risk and ESG matters more broadly that might inform the scope of directors' duties. And it also, of course, ignores the additional burden that companies might assume by virtue of their own voluntary commitments in respect of climate risk, uh, for example, uh, as part of a commitment to transition to net zero. So directors' obligations to identify, manage and report climate risk are being expanded at pace. Uh, but the question is, what private law claims might this give rise to? Well, before we get into the cause of action, um, uh, it's perhaps helpful to consider in broad terms what these claims might look like. And Saad and Rebecca, I know you've been given some thought to practical examples of claims we might see in practice. Uh, yes, so uh, thanks, David. So, so to start with, it's, it's not difficult to think of uh, possible scenarios. Uh, you could have allegations that uh, directors have failed to discharge their Section 172 duties to act in good faith to promote the success of the company or their Section 174 duties to exercise reasonable care, care skill and diligence uh, by failing to take adequate steps uh, to manage the financial risks posed by climate change. Um, or uh, conceivably, you could have breach of duty allegations where uh, remuneration policies are adopted by the directors uh, that create perverse incentives to employees that would undermine those environmental objectives. Um, more locally, you might have specific issues to do with company infrastructure projects uh, that a particular company wants to embark on or that perhaps a financial institution wishes to invest in. Um, you can imagine arguments about uh, failure to promote the success of the company by committing to a, a new plant that would end up being a stranded asset as electricity generation moves to a low carbon model. Um, uh, and those kinds of asset stranding issues have we've seen raised through public law challenges to the approval of, say, new power stations. So they might transfer to attempts to fix uh, liability of companies in the private sphere. Um, or, or similarly, you could have arguments about failures to properly disclose long term environmental impact of existing um, coal fired plants or something of that nature. So those claims. Uh, to do with um, uh, to do with breach of duty tend to blur as well into the uh, extensive network that David's uh, been identifying of disclosure obligations. 
Uh, and Rebecca, I know you have been giving some thought to those rather mixed scenarios uh, that you can help us with. Thanks, Sar. There, there certainly is scope for overlap in claims based on breach of duty and those involving disclosures. And, and we've actually seen a really interesting recent example of this in Australia. The case involved a claim brought against an Australian pension fund regarding its handling of climate risk uh, by a member. And it was alleged that the fund had failed to provide adequate information related to the risk posed by climate change, but also that the trustees had failed to act in the best interest of members and to exercise care, skill and diligence um, strategically. And the case ultimately settled with the fund agreeing to implement a net zero carbon footprint by 2050 uh, to measure, monitor and report its climate progress in line with the TCFD framework and also to provide disclosures in relation to, to climate, but also more widely its portfolio holding. So you can sort of see the effect that those types of claims can have, even if they don't, they don't ultimately proceed. Um, there is only, of course, so far our crystal ball gazing can take us today in identifying the sorts of scenarios in which uh, claims regarding disclosures could arise. But just to give a few examples, at one extreme, you could have a complete failure to address the impacts of environmental factors or climate change on, on a company's business and financial statements. But, but I mean, I think personally, it's increasingly difficult to envisage scenarios in which there could be a complete failure of that nature for most entities uh, in, in light of the increasing regulation and investor expectations that, that David has, has mentioned. Another scenario could involve disclosures which are allegedly inadequate or put differently where risks have not been explained uh, well enough or, or addressed adequately. And just for example, a, a claim was brought against a, a major bank in Australia involving allegations that it had failed to adequately disclose climate change related risks and in particular the risk related to possible investment in a particularly controversial coal mine. Uh, so that claim again was, was ultimately withdrawn after a subsequent annual report acknowledged the risk of climate change to the bank's operations. It could also be alleged that climate risks have been reported to some extent but in a misleading way that downplays the risks uh, posed to the success of the company by climate change and therefore the risk posed to investors. And uh, again, leading the charge in this space, we have seen some, some litigation of this nature in the US. Uh, one example is there were proceedings uh, successfully brought against Peabody Coal for misleading financial statements uh, under New York's Martin Act because only the most favorable IEA projections of coal growth had been used to base the company's own coal growth projections. And similarly, a, a claim was pursued against Exxon by the state of New York, alleging that the company had fraudulently misled its investors through its statements about how it accounted for the costs of climate change regulation. Um, but ultimately, that claim was ultimately dismissed in, in late 2019. So, so that gives just a few examples. And of course, risk could also arise in, in various other contexts. And, and I'll return to a couple of those towards the end. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, so given that very helpful list of possible scenarios, you might think that a wave of shareholder litigation is, is inevitable. Um, but certainly, as far as our own law is concerned, it's important to bear in mind that the duties are nearly in all cases owed to the company, not to the shareholders or investors. There are some uh, avenues that investors and shareholders uh, can use to bring claims, um, but uh, uh, the U UK law remains pretty restrictive in allowing shareholders to litigate uh, directors' decisions. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, derivative actions um, and then others are going to pick up on, on, on some of the other routes. So the principal route by which shareholders can claim is a statutory derivative action under the Companies Act, where a claim is brought in the name of the shareholders on behalf of the company against its directors. But critically, you need the permission of the court to continue the claim. Uh, and it's qu quite difficult, particularly with possible climate change complaints, to envisage circumstances in which that permission would actually be forthcoming. So, uh, as with everything we're discussing today, it's a very big topic. I can only hope to touch on a few of the issues. But uh, first of all, when you're talking about these uh, uh, conduct of energy majors, it's almost always through subsidiaries. Uh, 
the, the derivative claim is only available where the wrong is alleged against the directors of the parent company, not group subsidiaries. Where you're bringing a claim on behalf of a subsidiary, that's called a multiple derivative claim, and are only available in practice in fraud cases, which is not what we're concerned with here. Um, secondly, shareholders would not be able to make claims for alleged historical uh, breaches uh, if they were aware of those breaches at the time when they acquired their shareholding. That's obviously not an issue for long-standing um, strategic investors, but it would seem to exclude activist actions where the shares are bought for the purposes of pursuing a derivative claim in order to highlight some alleged wrong that has already been identified um, uh, before the shares were acquired. Third, no claim can lie for director actions that have been ratified by the company, e.g. by resolution of the shareholders. And if a claim is brought for an unratified act, then in practice it won't be allowed to continue without giving a proper opportunity for ratification. So what one's left with is the effect of most actions would simply be a prompt for ratification, aside perhaps from the really any really serious failures that wouldn't um, uh, be ratified by the shareholders of, but to them. Of course, that might in itself serve a litigation purpose in focusing the shareholder body on the decision in question. Um, uh, and you can think of that potentially arising perhaps with new investments in say some new coal mine where a shareholder might seek to might bring derivative proceedings alleging breach of the section 172 duty. Uh, one consequence of that might be uh, to force the issue to shareholder resolution rather than simply a decision by the board. But the fourth point is even if you get this far, um, no claim arises where a, reasonable, where a reasonable director complying with her section 172 duties would not bring the claim. And even if the director might bring the claim, then the court will only give permission where it's clear that bringing the claim would be important to the company. Um, that's again difficult for these kinds of claims. I mean, normally importance is something that's quite easy to assess. Is it a big loss? Is there a good chance of recovery? Are there other commercial factors? With these kinds of climate change scenarios, it's more difficult. Um, take a new coal mine, for example. It would involve saying that any reasonable director acting in accordance with their duties, having regard to the environment, would regard the investment as harmful to the company's uh, overall finances or reputation or litigation risks and would therefore immediately halt it. And merely stating that tends, I think, to show that in practice, these are incredibly difficult questions of commercial judgment for a court to undertake. And the court is rather unlikely to substitute its own view for that of the directors and allow these matters to continue. But what often happens is that faced with proceedings, the company delegates the decision to an independent committee and if that committee reaches the same conclusion, then that is a very important factor uh, against um, uh, the court permitting the claim to continue. Um, uh, and if that were not enough, then obviously there's the ever important question of how actually, uh, if a claim such as this was sought to be brought, how it would be uh, funded, because as you will imagine, these sorts of claims are by no means cheap to run. So that's uh, derivative actions, but um, Rebecca, can you, uh, I think you were going to deal with some of the other possible routes for shareholders or investors. Yes, thanks, Saad. That leaves us with the uh, final issue of whether there is scope for shareholders and investors to pursue claims in connection with the allegedly deficient dis disclosures or, or other misleading statements. And in considering this issue, it's, I think, useful to start by just making a few points about the wider context. Disclosures in relation to climate change related risks may be subject to more inherent uncertainty or may be more difficult to verify than certain other information. For example, given um, the, the, the use of forward looking statements and the relevance of qualitative as, as well as quantitative information. And so there are some difficult judgment calls to be made for business uh, in, in this space. In that regard, it is, it is worth noting that financial institutions have been affected by the trend towards mandatory disclosure earlier than corporates operating in, in other sectors. And they, they also face the added complication that uh, in selling investments or financial products, they are often one step removed from the relevant climate impacts that, that are in question. Uh, however, it is fair to say that the reporting issue is certainly now a hot topic for all corporates by 
necessity. And as, as David has touched on, the issue is, is also not just limited to what a company says in order to comply with, with uh, mandatory requirements, but also what it says above and beyond those requirements, uh, what it chooses to say in the context of wider stakeholder management. Uh, and for example, a growing number of companies have been uh, seeking to develop climate transition plans with a view to uh, outlining their strategies to move toward net zero and it, figuring out strategies for engaging with uh, investors and shareholders about that. So in this wider context, we know that a lot of, of our clients and then other entities have, have already been grappling with the best way of assessing risk and, and communicating with investors and, and, and stakeholders about their own climate change related risks and sustainability strategies uh, in order to mitigate risk in a wide range of contexts. So we can only look at this uh, at a relatively high level today and that there is no one size fits all approach uh, to this, this difficult question and issue. However, the risk of claims arising is perhaps most acute in relation to annual reporting in the context that we've explained, but also in other circumstances where investors or potential investors may well rely on the information that's being provided to make decisions. So for example, uh, trans transaction specific risks could arise in the context of IPOs, uh, M&A transactions, demergers, or bond issuances. And in that context, the, the content and the language of prospectuses, shareholder circulars, or other documents can assume real practical and legal importance. So we have not seen any key cases in connection with allegedly defective or misleading climate change disclosures in the UK to date. But as we, we touched on earlier, we, we have seen some claims of this, this nature arising elsewhere. And in principle, there are some avenues which could enable claims to be pursued in the UK. So what are they? Uh, well, first, there are certain potentially relevant statutory causes of action. In particular, Section 90A and Schedule 10A of FISMA provides investors with a basis for seeking compensation from certain issuers, namely UK issuers and entities trading securities on a UK market, uh, where there is an untrue or misleading statement in or a dishonest omission of a required information from certain publications, which would include annual reports and accounts, um, which have been made by an issuer. And just dishonest delay in publishing that sort of information could, could, could be relevant as well. And where investors have suffered loss as a result, that, that may give rise to a claim under Section 90A. Uh, this, this regime excludes other forms of, of civil liability subject to a few notable carve-outs, including claims under um, another provision of FISMA, under contract, statutory misrepresentation, and for, for neg negligent misstatement. So it is worth noting that the threshold for success is quite high. Investors would need to show that they've relied on the relevant statement or omission uh, in acquiring, continuing to hold or disposing of shares. And the test is one of dishonesty or recklessness. Uh, so in, in, in other words, the applicable liability standard is fraud, not negligence. Um, but it is nonetheless a cause of action which, which could be pursued. Now, Section 90A would not be relevant for any uh, alleged misstatements or omissions from listing particulars or prospectuses, uh, which would be covered separately by Section 90 of FISMA, uh, which provides a remedy for investors acquiring securities and suffering loss as a result of any untrue or misleading statements or, or omissions uh, of information in a prospectus or listing particulars, subject to various defences, including reasonable belief, uh, or if the claimant knew of the falsity or the relevant omission, and so couldn't possibly have, have relied upon it. Second, there may also be scope for investors to pursue claims in negligent misstatement. For instance, in connection with the contents of shareholder circulars in some instances. As a starting point, it would be necessary uh, for investors to show that directors had assumed responsibility in respect of the content of the document in order to establish the existence of a duty of care. And also, of course, that the duty had been breached, causing shareholders to sustain recoverable loss. These sorts of claims could also potentially go hand in hand with allegations that there has been a breach of an equitable duty for directors to provide shareholders with sufficient information that is material to the, to the decision they are being asked to make. 
And of course, although we were uh, considering these issues as a matter of English law, issues of jurisdiction and applicable law may well be important depending on the circumstances. So to recap, there are certainly some possible avenues which could enable shareholders or investors to pursue claims. It's not going to be necessarily an easy path for the investors to follow. They're likely to face various challenges in pursuing these sorts of claims. So um, just for example, there's the dishonesty recklessness threshold for Section 90 claims that I've mentioned. In the context of uh, negligent misstatement claims, it would be necessary to establish the existence of a duty. And in that regard, a lot may turn on the precise language that is used. And it may, in some circumstances, be challenging to establish reliance on an allegedly deficient disclosure or that any loss has been suffered or indeed that any such loss has um, been caused by the disclosures in question. However, the litigation that we have seen in other countries uh, certainly suggests that these challenges and these, these obstacles are unlikely to be a barrier to claims being pursued in the UK. Finally, as we have touched on very briefly, there's also a wider risk in connection with greenwashing, including uh, scope for increased regulatory scrutiny and soft law complaints. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so that's everything that we wanted to cover this evening. But before we conclude, perhaps um, I could invite some final reflections from you both on what this all means for private law claims in the UK in respect of climate risk. So, uh, Rebecca, do you want to go first or shall I? Sure, I think that that sounds that sounds good. So we, we have not seen um, much climate change litigation in the UK to date. Uh, and I, I think that's an important takeaway. And as discussed so far, we've we've mainly seen uh, public law challenges, which is a, a trend that that's set to continue. However, there is certainly also scope for private law claims to arise. Uh, and just to 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 reinforce that, I mean, what, what we've seen from particularly from Rebecca's very helpful survey of the cases, it, it really is a global phenomenon. In the past, it is often proven to be the case that uh, litigation trends that uh, begin in the US spread uh, and sometimes find their way to the UK, uh, sometimes in a in a more qualified way. Uh, but that, I think, uh, does at least raise the possibility that what we're seeing in the US may migrate here in due course. Thank you both. I'd agree with all of that. And I think um, it's, uh, it's perhaps also important to bear in mind that Climate litigation claims are often pursued for strategic reasons and not necessarily based on uh, the likelihood of success or the likelihood of any significant damages. So I think this is one of those areas where it's important to separate the risk of claims from the risk of liability. Um, so that's, I think, everything we were going to cover. Um, we've perhaps got time just for, for one question which has come through and I think is probably best directed to you, Saad. Um, sure. So, we, shall I read out the question? The, the question is, when referring to the climate majors as a block, could you foresee the scenario where they are held liable for scope three emissions as well as scope one and two? From what you're saying, this seems to be the case, assuming the causation hurdle could ever be overcome. So, referring to scope three emissions is essentially emissions from assets that are not those of the producers, but are caused by those to whom the producers uh, sell hydrocarbons. I think it's a very good question. Um, I, I've, I've raised it when I've discussed matters because that is the basis of many of the US claims that we're now seeing in this second wave, where they're seeking to fix the producers of the hydrocarbons with liability, um, not necessarily simply because uh, of any uh, emissions that they are directly responsible for, but for the emissions of those to whom they sell the hydrocarbons for. It is obviously the most extreme uh, kind of case. Uh, more extreme than seeking to fix a, uh, a, a, an, a, a, an emitter for their share of emissions. Um, uh, and it is particularly challenging. It's interesting in the US cases that often, of course, the municipalities are themselves emitters uh, and they disclaim uh, any attempt to fix the, the defendants with the consequences of their own emissions. So there is a clear tension there between, on the one hand, seeking to fix the liability of the people who get the hydrocarbons out of the ground versus the people who are actually responsible for burning it. Um, I think the most that one can say is that it's it's the most extreme kind of case. It clearly raises formidable challenges. I'm certainly not saying that it would be likely 
uh, to uh, succeed. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, I think there is a real question there about whether you can properly fix the producer with liability in, in circumstances where the causal chain necessarily involves somebody who has voluntarily chosen to emit uh, based on burning those hydrocarbons. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And I think that takes us um, up to the end of our time. So I think all that's left is to say thank you uh, very much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, we hope you found that informative. And of course, if there are any points you'd like to hear more about, please don't hesitate to contact us. But otherwise, thank you very much and have a good evening.